I'll tell you one thing that's fantastic before you get started on today's talk. Um, YouTube TV. Are you familiar? No? Okay. Let me let me tell you. Let me tell you. Uh, this is going back to like the Greek yogurt stuff, all right? But oh this boy. is something okay. back house. So, so my my neighbor friend of mine, about geez, I don't know, about a year and a half, two years ago, is like he he they moved in. And I don't know how he got in the subject, but he's like, Yeah, I just uh, you know, who do you guys use for cable and all that? And he told him. And, and he's like, Oh, well, I I didn't even use a cable provider. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, Well, no, I I just have YouTube TV. And I'm like, and he says, everything's streaming. And he says, it's really cool. And I, I said, oh, yeah. And I didn't th really, in my mind, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, it's like streaming in my mind, right? You know, Netflix, you know, we use Netflix and everything. But I think of like, oh, you lose all your cable channels or you don't have all the things that cable gives you, all the great things. Um, so finally, I stepped up to the plate and I got YouTube TV it was partly because of like his recommendation back then, but then learned more recently, I think it was Google, the parent company, bought the rights to whatever the, the football, the NFL package is in the future. So it doesn't matter who your favorite team is. Mine happens to be the Las Vegas Raiders, never on TV around here unless they're in a primetime game. So now with this service, you'll be able to watch any kind of game you want and because you're such a huge football fan <laughs> yeah. i can see how bored you are right now in this conversation but that's okay <laughs> um no my my but i just want to tell you about the experience because yeah. i didn't really understand literally there's no cable boxes there's no anything you just plug your internet into your tv and you sign into youtube tv and you have all these channels um, you have local channels, which is a misconception. You have all these different local channels. So if you love channel seven news as I do watch channel seven news. Um, and then you can kind of pick whatever else you want. But the best thing was once you log in for the first time in so many words, it asks you, Hey, what do you like to watch? And so my wife and I, maybe like others, like at night, we don't watch a lot of like real TV. We watch like the, the streaming services, but like Dateline right is always on right at night but then we always seem to miss it we always seem to get there like halfway through it so it's like you select all these different things that you like and it automatically saves them for you and then whenever you want to watch you just click and bang you're watching your favorite shows it's no cable boxes brought all the cable boxes back got rid of all the wires all that stuff you just plug in the internet to the back of your tv and away you go life-changing that's great that's great okay I'm, I'm cracking up because um, in some ways um, you're dating yourself and in some ways I just love the excitement about new technology and I know that you, um, uh, you this thing about Greek yogurt just to explain for anybody who's watching this is that you, you do this right you get very excited about these things that you discover and several years ago it was Greek yogurt actually a long time ago it's greek yogurt and we always gave you such a hard time about it but i'm with you on all that stuff so but you know whenever you know often whenever you're trying to watch like an on-demand movie or something on your regular cable always seems to be like a glitch there's always like a pause or it stops working or the rewind doesn't work and and not to mention like they charge you for everything and this is just so clean and easy and I think just representative, how am I going to tie this back to finance, Ravia? Well, let me show you. Um, it's it's it representative of how all these things are changing, changing our lives. Now, I don't want to get too dramatic about YouTube TV and 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 you know being life changing, but it is representative of how technology and innovation and all these things are slowly and i have a problem with the word slowly but surely changing our lives and and impacting our lives in so many different ways not only our longevity 
when it comes to healthcare and all the information that we know now about nutrition and everything, but medical technology, literally technology that keeps us alive, good, maybe good in a lot of ways and bad in some, yeah. right? Um, yeah. um, but then all these innovations and such that are just uh, so representative of progress. And where does that come from? That comes from the innovation, the progress of human beings within great companies, right? And a lot of these great companies, we all can invest in if we deem um, 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 useful to our to our to our own portfolios. Um, and I said I have a problem with the word slow because it's like, we can say, oh yeah, well, this has been happening for some time, but I mean, the internet to most of us was like brand new in the year 2000, right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And we're only 20 or so years removed from that. It's just interesting. Yeah. No, I think I, it's, it's funny because you said, and I have a problem with the word slowly. I think slowly is really fundamental to this conversation because, um, you know, again, speaking about football, we have been talking about uh, how sometimes you tend to expect miracles in a, in a game, right? Mm -hmm. But really, most times, um, it's incremental plays, it's incremental change that results in an outcome you are uh, intending or hoping for. And I think right. same goes with you know, perhaps the evolution of your streaming experience or your television watching experience, same goes for someone's portfolio, for our portfolios, right? We have very few times is it that you like, there's like a sudden something happens and miraculously, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a blip. I mean, those are really blips. The, 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 the real story is the slow story. I mean, come on, you can speak into a device, yeah, kind of looks like this. That's mine. Yeah, that's right. And you can say things like, "Hey Alexa, <laughs> buy me this," and it literally, in a lot of cases, can arrive at your door the same day. To me, that's remarkable. And I know it's been something that's been in process for a while, but. Then you extrapolate that to, well, if I don't have to get in the car and drive, I'm saving money on gas and I'm doing this. And it's just, it's it's always been so incredibly interesting and intriguing to me on how, no matter what is going on in the world, how the economy keeps moving forward. I mean, think of all the challenges. You know, I mentioned the year 2000 as, you know, not that long ago, right? Because it wasn't 22 years ago. And, um, Think of all the challenges, right? Challenges to progress that we've seen from, well, at 2000, it was actually the dot-com collapse. And then it was the accounting scandals. Then it was 9-11. And then it was, you know, after all the- <laughs> Last 10 years are a blur. <laughs> uh, I mean, everything. Then it was the the real estate and and the the near collapse of the entire financial system from oh seven to oh nine. Then it was the um 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 geez, everything, all the volatility that we've seen. And then of course we don't have to talk about the last three or four years with with um um pandemic and, and quarantine and, and inflation and the Ukraine, Russia. Everything. So you, you can point to all these examples of all these impediments to progress. And then you can look at that same exact time period and look what the heck has just happened here in terms of progress. It's pretty freaking remarkable. Yeah. And then, then you've got to ask yourself, if you're being honest with yourself, what's the next 25 years going to look like? And are you going to look at that with a through the through the the glasses or so of well you know the next year you know we've got some challenges you know look at hey I, you know i know we're gonna have challenges you know that that's that's part of life that's part of the economy the ebb and flow but gosh i mean what kind of progress are we going to see over the next 25 years and how is that going to materialize in your ability to live the kind of independent life financially and otherwise that you may want. 
yeah. for example, how does that materialize in your portfolio and the investments that you own? Um, it's just remarkable to me. And, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just have that. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, you just reminded me of something. I was just reading an article. I was looking up how many bear markets there have been in the past, um, oh, since the inception, well, actually since 1928. Let's just say from 1928, this article. So I have to go and actually count it myself. But this article said between 1928 and 2020, so not counting where we are today, there were 28 wow. bear markets. And wow. so this is not surprising. Well, yes, that is a wow, but get this. This is the second part. There were 27 bull markets. It's really interesting like because, and I'm saying this to you because you just took us through a timeline from 2000 today that had like all the calamities, right? Mm -hmm. All the, all the challenges that we've been through a very mm -hmm. few, t I mean, you don't actually sit pe see people sitting back and going, let me go through all the triumphs of the past uh, 20 odd some years, right? It's just like mm -hmm. this, which we know is this negativity bias, right? We tend to remember all the pain much sure. more than we do the good stuff so that's amazing that's right 27 bull markets yeah that's amazing yeah i mean i was gonna I, I actually didn't know that figure offhand i was gonna guess at least 20 but like 28 that's that's uh yeah that's that's remarkable and then i mean my where my brain goes next right is that okay so i think about in particular the work that we do as financial advisors as advisors of clients and families and some of the questions that I get from new clients, prospective clients about how to allocate their portfolio. And sometimes the questions go along the lines of how do I protect myself? Mm. And that materializes in, I think, what is really traditional in this industry of having a portion. And if you're near retirement or already in retirement, oftentimes I see a really big portion of somebody else's portfolio being invested in in bonds right in fixed income that's really traditional it's it's um you know you hear it come up as well take your you know take a hundred and subtract your age and that's you know how much you should have in equity so the other you know if you're 80 years old you should have 20 uh percent of your portfolio in in equities and, and 80 percent in bonds and Kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit because bonds being a fixed rate of interest that don't give you as a long-term investor the exposure to all of this progress that we're just talking about, right? Yeah. Instead, it's giving you protection against the frequent but temporary declines that you're talking about, right? The the bear markets or even the normal everyday corrections. So if there's been, and, and I know I, we did a blog on this, uh, so I did research on it, it's not coming to mind right now, but if we've seen 28 or so bear markets since the 1920s, how many overall corrections, because a market is defined as a, a fall from a high of 20% or more in any given period. A correction, on the other hand, is a lot less of a uh, requirement. It's just a 10% fall, which we see a lot of those. And I think, I don't know if I went all the way back for, to there. I think I may have gone just to world the end of World War II. But if we've seen 28 bear markets, I got to imagine we've seen 50 or 60 corrections. I could be wrong, but it's a, it's a, it's a bigger number. That's for sure. And so having said all that, and you look at all those periods and that overall you've seen, even though it's not a straight line, but the, the average line over all those years is like this. Then the question comes, geez, you know, I'm retiring soon or I'm in retirement. And on one hand, it sounds good to protect myself from these bear markets or corrections that we'll inevitably see over time. But then for some, or at least the folks that talk to us, we, po we pose the question, well, what are you giving up? 
for that, at least that feeling of protection. What are you giving up? And what you end up giving up to me is the exposure to that progress over the long term for at least for the for the trade-off of that feeling like I'm being protected. But then you look at any 20 or 30 year time period in the and I mean the empirical evidence is there is that that's that's not a that's not remotely a winning winning philosophy. Um, so it's something that 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 I I uh, educate folks on and, and really have conversations with about, geez, you know, is fixed income or bonds, are they the right answer for you in what you're trying to accomplish long term? Does that yeah. make sense? Well, I mean, it does. And I think it might even help to make it simpler than maybe even simpler than that. You know, somebody said, maybe it was you who said, um, I think we were in a class one day and you were talking about, you know, why would I invest in something that gives me a fixed rate of return when everything else is getting more expensive? I think you may have said that, All right? Um, right? right. When, when costs are increasing, uh, how could I be invested in something that is not increasing? I mean, the, the, the difference between those things is just going to continue to um, increase over time and I will have a shortfall. I mean, it's not even it's not a, it's not up for debate. I will have a shortfall. Um, so that, that's actually a great point, Ravi, because as I as I hear you talk, I think about retirement, right? Moving into retirement. So I mean, it's working for most of your life to that point. And now they're retired. Financially, I don't want to oversimplify this, but I, I I don't think I am. Financially, it really comes down to one binary question, which is. Am I going to, am I as the investor, am I going to outlive my assets or are my assets going to outlive me? In other words, am I going to have enough money for to last the rest of my life so I can maintain this, this level of independence financially for me and my family and, and preferably for generations to come? Or am I running the risk of becoming dependent? upon whether it's something like social security or um my own children financially or otherwise when i hear you say that that's that's where my mind goes is that really it's a, it's a longevity question it's like am am i you know am i going to outlive my assets or am i going or are my assets going to outlive me and the the preference, I think, is is obvious, right? I don't think anybody's going to answer that question to not want their assets to outlive them. But inflation, the cost of it is you could you could whittle it down to that 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 major point, right? Is that everything in our lives, most everything in our lives over time moves up and moves up rather significantly, rather silently, but significantly over time. And so it just doesn't make sense for a lot of folks to have any significant portion of their life savings being tied to something fixed, since all of our costs are not fixed, they're variable and they're variable in that in that direction. direction. Um, yeah. So if it is really, you know, and, and that what you're talking about, the longevity issue, um, we are all um, living longer and longer, that's the case, then it really goes back to, we know it rationally, rationally, we know that due to, we started this conversation out talking about innovation, due to innovation, mm -hmm. we are just living longer. And, mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, investor behavior doesn't always support this fact. Like it's, we don't always act as though we know that we're going to live a long time. We actually act as though we're not going to live very long. <laughs> and and I guess, before, right? I guess the question that comes to mind for me is why do people gravitate towards bonds in the first place? Why do investors gravitate towards bonds? And why does the financial industry um, recommend bonds to, to those people? Um, well, I have a feeling, certainly, based on my experience on why investors, and we already talked about it, right? And we talked about the concept of things happening slowly, mm -hmm. right? And so I think as a human being, it's really difficult 
let's take the last year in the market. So we went through a bear market. You know, we go through a bear market once every five years. A year in the context of your retirement is not a long time. We all know that, right? But a year in the context of every day living right now and facing the negativity that we hear in the media or your brother-in-law, right? <laughs> about how you're not investing your money the right way. You need to be in crypto or you need to, I can't believe you're investing in the equity markets today. Look how bad things are. Um, That's a good brother-in-law uh, voice. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, it's my best. That's my best brother-in-law voice. Um, sounds nothing like my brother-in-law. My brother-in-laws are fantastic, by the way. Uh, but, uh, but we hear that from time to time. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, I lost my train of thought here now, but um, um, the certainty aspect, I think, is what we're all craving as human beings, right? Because, you know, given the choice, you like to be certain about things, right? I like to be certain, but then financially, at least, you pay a big price for certainty, a big price, and you're giving up a lot for that certainty. And the, and the tough part about that is you don't know it right away until five years goes by 10 years goes by and your costs and your expenses go in the upward direction and your portfolio just meanders along at, at basically a, a fixed type of return and all of a sudden not all of a sudden um but a few years goes by and then the income those returns from your portfolio um aren't now enough to satisfy the costs of your living expenses, your lifestyle. What happens then? Well, now you take more and more money out of the principal of your portfolio, and that really drags down your ability to outlive, uh, um, for your, I'm sorry, your assets to outlive you. So I, I think the answer to the question is, I think we all as human beings, we are pre-programmed emotionally to crave certainty. And um, it's totally normal. Um, but just because something's totally normal, I also want to down a pint of ice cream before I go to bed, right? <laughs> my body, my mind is telling me, Giffords Moose Tracks, you need that in your life right now. But, you know, um, it's not the best for me, right? So um, you've got to... You've got to have a mentality, as we do, of asking why, a number of things. Why am I feeling this way? Why? You know, examine that. Um, don't take it at face value. I think the easier question to answer is your second question, I think, was about, well, why does the industry do this? Well, industry is pretty smart. Right? <laughs> Sell them what they want. <laughs> right? Industry knows what folks will buy. Industry knows particularly during times of challenge that our emotions are rife for um, um, making decisions um, on certainty, on that craving of certainty. Um, the industry, you could argue, is responsible for a lot of this negativity out there. I mean, when these periods come up and when I got in the business in 2004 and it's the same today, but whenever we go through a little bit of a shakeup in the market or the economy, you start hearing those words out there like, oh, downside protection. Mm -hmm. Downside protection. In other words, um, buy a product, a financial product that is going to remove you from all this pain. And just not realistic. It's not, it, it's not congruent with how the economy and how the markets work. It's, it's giving you an emotional out. And the cost of that, even though it's not so clear and evident when you may do something like this, the cost of that is tremendous over time. And that's what, as you know, that's what we spend our time educating the folks that we come in contact with. And we know going into it, it's really hard for all of us as human beings to sometimes see what the actual truth is because the pain sometimes is so great 
Um, and I, I, I don't think I've really experienced a period with a, with a, with a client, with a family where the pain or the, 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 the anxiety, the stress is so tremendous as with somebody that is either getting very close to retirement or just newly retired. That is in my experience over the last almost two decades working with retirees, the can be the pinnacle of emotional stress when it comes to money. And I get it. Understandable. Get totally it. understandable. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I asked you the question about the industry and why, why the industry wants to sell you bonds. I mean, obviously I know the answer to that and it's always important to hear it and hear it again. Um, goes back mm -hmm. to ask why if someone is very eager to sell you something that is going to put you out of your pain wonder <laughs> it, it, it begs the question like what do they stand to gain what do I stand to gain mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. always good to take a yeah. closer look and I think so this is something you talk about in so many of your articles and your talks is not to take everything at face value and I just appreciate that it doesn't mean that you know this is the truth or whatever. Everybody needs to figure out what, what's right for them. And you know that um, when you um, choose certainty, you give up opportunity. Yeah. I mean, we all, we, you and I talk about it a lot. We, we, we uh, even on these, these podcasts, right. We've, we've used the phrase unknown and unknowable. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. so we're all in the same boat, no matter who you are with respect to the future. Yeah. Don't know. So what's the best step that at least we feel that we can take with anybody we come in contact with is, okay, well, let's look at history a little bit for specific things about, hey, what are the asset classes that over time have shown to be the best way of achieving that financial independence that our folks, everybody, everybody ultimately wants? And then how do you, how do you act on that? And, and then what are the things that you're going to face? Now, I just got done saying the future is unknown and unknowable. So we'll go back to the past and we'll say, okay, well, historically speaking, every, every five years or so, we're going to go through, on average, really, really tough time. Time that's going to cause you to question the plan that you put in place and you'll be at your highest rate of, or high, you, you'll be at your highest opportunity of, of making uh, a poor decision during those tough times. Um, and that, that's, that's pretty frequent. That's pretty frequent. Um, and so we, we just spend our time educating folks on, Hey, despite that looking past that, taking a little bit step up, a step away and looking at the bigger picture, you'll see that, hey, we've been through a lot of these once every five years on average. What did you say before? 28 bear markets since 1929. Um, many, many more corrections that never became bear markets, which should tell you something too. Um, and um, historically speaking, the path for the, the financial independence is right out there in front of you to see. Um, but it's hard. It's mm -hmm. really hard being in the here and now. And um, just like anything else in life, that's why you have coaches in certain things that have experience in going through things, or you have a nutritionist that you work with. You know, a good nutritionist is going to know that once you start cutting the sugar away, the first couple of weeks, it's going to be 930 at night. You're going to be turning on that episode of Dateline. <laughs> and it's like it's, your brain is going to start telling you, I need this now. <laughs> and um, um, and a nutritionist, a good nutritionist is going to prep you for that. So your body is going to tell you it needs things that you don't need because it's so used to having that. And you got to fight it and know that what we're talking about in terms of a nutritional plan or an investment plan that despite these feelings you're going to have in the near term, um, this is the path that historically speaking has, has taken people to where they need to go. And for folks that have had success changing lifestyle and nutrition and health, 
know that if you can get over those few weeks, really bad cravings and such, they start to level out. You, know, you start coming back down to earth and things become a little bit more clear. And, um, you know, you stretch that out though in the financial world to once every five years on average, we run the risk of forgetting, Yeah, you know, all of these things that we, that we need to remember. And that's what our job is. It's less about the X's and O's, however important it is, the investment strategy, uh, and then back up a little bit, the plan itself, a big part of our job um, is actually understanding and being there for our folks when we know they're going to have those huge, huge cravings that are going to throw them off course, those sugar cravings or those huge emotions where their body, their mind is telling them, I'm going to do something different here. I got to, I got to go after that ice cream. Hmm. Hmm. Well, this is where you heard it, not just financial advice, but nutritional guidance. <laughs> and what I love about these conversations is there's always um, a real parallel to just being in life itself where everything is unknown and unknowable. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, being open. To and it all starts with YouTube TV. <laughs> and it all starts with YouTube TV. And, and you, you are not getting paid to say this. <laughs> I'm not being paid to say this. I literally signed up a week ago. It's been life so far. That's fantastic. Um, and no exaggeration there. But um, in any yeah, event, but for more <laughs> on YouTube TV and the pending Raiders schedule for next year that I'll be watching on YouTube TV and anything else, beckbody.com, B-E-C-K-B-O-D-E.com is our website where you can find a lot of great information. It's also a place where you can uh, enter some information to get a copy of our Bible, so to speak, our book, Dancing with the Analysts. You can also go there to learn more about us as a company and the, the great folks that we have within the company. And uh, then, of course, social media outlets, channels like Instagram and Facebook, at Beck Bodie um, is our, our handles across the board, I think, or at Beck mm -hmm. Bodie, yeah, WM, yeah. maybe Facebook. Yeah. In any event, there's a lot of good information there. Probably it's where you're watching you're watching this podcast right now. You're seeing it. Um, but love doing these with you, Ravia. Can't wait for the next one. Thank you. Bye Likewise, you. Ben. And just before we say goodbye, just Ben is the um, one of the founders and uh, managing partner and chief investment officer at Beck Bodie. And um, my name is Ravia, and I'm a big fan and follower. Good to spend this time with you. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you. Bye-bye.